Thank you all for coming on a Saturday morning. It was hard to get out of bed this morning for me, but I'm here. Um, you know, I actually want us um, to talk a little bit about uh, the caregiver, and I want us to kind of go through a several aspects of this. One is, why focus on the caregiver? And I think that point uh, may not be lost on many of you in this room, but it's an important point uh, in terms of framing our conversation about why in the healthcare system we should care about the caregiver. The unmet caregiver needs in oncology, what those are, uh, there has been some research on that area. And I'll give you a very brief um, view of a, a study that we're working on now of developing a population-specific caregiver intervention. I use this as a model because I do think our research should really be a lot more population specific and I'll try to make the argument as to why that is important, both in the context of severe mental illness, but also in thinking about caregiver interventions in general in oncology. And then kind of talk a little bit about where do we go from here from a research perspective as you know, my passion is really moving the field forward from a research perspective. So why focus on the caregivers? Um, we know that family and friends, and I should say, when I speak about caregivers in the context of this talk, I'm really fo focusing on informal caregivers. So family and friends who are providing care for uh, patients uh, with cancer. We know that family and friends play a critical role in providing care for patients with cancer. In fact, 65% of the care provided for patients with cancer is really given by family members. Um, caring for a loved one with cancer is incredibly challenging and requires significant physical and emotional stamina. And most of us are thrown in this caregiving role really with little or no preparation whatsoever. Without knowledge, without resources, without skills, go. You have a cancer diagnosis in a family member, go. So addressing the needs of caregivers is really necessary to improve both patient and caregiver outcomes when we think about it from a healthcare system perspective. This is a study that was done by one of my colleagues, Jamie Jacobs, that looked at patients and caregivers, uh, patients with lung and GI cancer uh, and caregivers. And I'm gonna kinda walk you through this because it's a busy slide. The first thing I'm gonna show here is just the rates of anxiety and depression. And these are clinically significant anxiety and depression, both patients and caregivers. And we should note that caregiver anxiety really exceeds that of the patient in dealing with these illnesses, and that's important. The more important point to make on this slide, though, is the interdependence between patients' psychological well-being and caregiver psychological well-being. So through sophisticated statistical modeling, Jamie was able to show that really patient depression, as you can see here, and caregiver depression are interdependent on patient and caregiver anxiety. And that's not rocket science, right? The idea that caregiver and patient's distress are interlinked and interdependent should be rather intuitive to all of us. So that's one reason we should care about caregiver outcomes is that they may actually impact patient distress. This is a study that was published in JCO several years ago looking at predictors of caregiver depression. And I show this slide only to show that both patient and caregiver factors are important in predicting caregiver distress, both in terms of patient performance status, the burden of caregiving involved, as well as caregiver characteristics. And this is actually one of my favorite recent studies. We've been, for a long time in the field of oncology, trying to show the relationship between social support and survival. So survival is an important marker, obviously, of how patients are doing with their cancer. This is a really neat study from the uh, nursing study group that looked at patients with colorectal cancer, and they actually sort of categorized their caregiving and social support into four different categories. Based on the level of engagement with the caregiver, how much caregiver support they had in a given week, and what you see here is actually the lowest category to the highest category and the survival of this patient population with colorectal cancer. And clearly those with the highest level of caregiving support and, and caregiving engagement did a lot better. They actually lived longer compared to patients who had less support. Again, establishing the importance of caregiving in terms of providing better care for our patients with cancer. There are a lot of research that needs to still be done to really describe in detail the unmet needs in the context of cancer caregiving. But I'm going to highlight a 
relatively recent review that looked at the different domains of problems that caregivers experience from physical health, emotional problems, the impact of caregiving on responsibilities in daily life and social problems. So to give us a sense, and this is a summary of about 35 studies that really has been done in the field, looking at physical health problems that caregivers experience from pain, sleep disturbance, fatigue, physical exhaustion, weight loss, loss of physical strength, muscle tension, social problems including financial concerns, disruption to work and education, role strain, managing the health environment and communication with the healthcare team, lack of information, loss of in intimacy and sexual concerns, isolation, uh, emotional problems including clinically significant anxiety and depression, uncertainty, hopelessness, helplessness, powerlessness, guilt when you're kind of having this tension between am I being a really good caregiver but I have 50 other things that I need to be doing at the same time. And I should say, you know, I, I put this on the slide, but I do think there is something positive about emotional experience of caregiving. And we all value that positive emotional experience. And there have been a couple of qualitative studies talk about this idea of caregiving growth um, potential psychologically. So there, not all of caregiving is negative. There are certainly cer certain aspects that help us psychologically from a caregiving perspective. I'd say that area, positive emotional experience of caregiving, is probably the area that has gotten the least attention and requires more and more research. Research. To walk us a little bit more, when it comes to burden of caregiving, there are multiple aspects that we should be focused on. One is really the direct care of patients, and this is probably the role that uh, caregivers are least prepared for. So this is sort of managing dressing changes, uh, helping and assisting patients with mobility at home, uh, issues related to providing really medical care at home that a lot of our caregivers do for our patients with cancer. Indirect care of patients, this includes going to appointments, helping with medical decision making, talking to the doctors, talking to the nurses. Um, in the context of all of this, we're also struggling with other care responsibilities. How do I take care of the kids? How do I take care of my other family members? How do I balance our finances? And as a result, there's a tremendous impact on caregiver daily life. You know, a lot of caregivers speak in a lot of our qualitative research about just the fact that they've lost their friends that they have no time for leisure activities, that they don't remember the last time they went to see a movie. There is a complete change in our usual routine and lifestyle as a result. This was a really nice um, study that really kind of tried to highlight that the unmet needs of caregivers really span the illness trajectory. And this is really important, and I think that is really where the field needs to move forward, that we really need to be clever about how we develop interventions that target the needs of caregiver at various points in the illness trajectory. I'm not gonna walk you through all of this, but caregiving needs really change, whether it's at the time of pre-diagnosis, during the diagnosis phase, when the focus is on the psychology of the diagnosis, on the patient, the, the fear of what will happen. During treatment, the focus is really on managing symptoms and side effects of therapy. But those, uh, those needs don't end there. There are clear survivorship needs. There are clear needs of caregivers during recurrent phases if the, if the illness comes back. And I would say the highest and probably uh, the highest caregiving burden in the context of oncology happens at the advanced and end of life care for our patients and families. Because at that point, caregivers are managing very high symptom burden, often trying to do that at home, difficulty with family relationships, lack of really financial resources to help them. So this is to really show that really caregiving needs do change during the illness course. And currently, when we sort of develop caregiver interventions, we don't take that into account, and that is relevant for us to think about. It's important to say that there are incredibly limited research in the area of what are the unique caregiving needs in the context of cancer and severe mental illness. And that's really important. This area is wide open, and there's a lot of research that's lacking. But we do know that caregiving burden in the context of severe mental illness alone is likely higher than most caregiving burden in the context of illness. Uh, there's tremendous caregiver anxiety, feeling of guilt and shame that are probably unique to this patient population. And I should say that it's important to think of this concept of chronic caregiving. So when a patient with a severe mental illness um, develops cancer, this person has been dependent in many ways on their caregiver throughout their life. And now there's this acute stressor on top of a chronic caregiving illness model. And that changes the dynamic a lot. 
And I think it's important to remember, as Kelly mentioned earlier, that really, in the context of severe mental illness, we're talking about multiple caregivers. We're not talking about one person. We're talking about a family. We're talking about a community that is affected by the patient's illness. So to summarize this, I hope I have convinced you there are really substantial needs affecting multiple domains in, in terms of caregiving, both in terms of physical health, social functioning, emotional needs, caregiving responsibilities. Importantly, caregiving uh, needs really span the illness course, and we need to develop more population and illness-specific interventions. And with that in mind, I kind of want to talk to you a little bit about the model that we tried to develop in the context of stem cell transplantation. So I'm a, an oncologist specializing in the care of patients with blood cancers. And one intensive treatment that we provide this patient population is blood and stem cell transplant. It's a very aggressive treatment. It requires a three to four week hospitalization. And there's tremendous uh, research showing tremendous caregiving burden in the context of stem cell transplantation. We know that addressing the needs of caregivers may help our patient population, and we know that there are no interventions in this area. So one of the first things we did is actually outline this illness experience. What does this look? This is based on research we have done and others have done. And I'm just going to orient you to this slide because it's a good model to think about how we develop caregiver interventions. But here what you see is the stem cell transplant is day zero, which is what happens during hospitalization. We look backwards and there are some days prior to transplant when these patients receive chemotherapy and prepare for the stem cell transplant. And their recovery period goes up to three months post-transplant in this slide. And what we outlined on top is really the patient experience, what's happening medically to the patient, including what's happening psychologically and emotionally as well as medically. And what we outline on the bottom based on our qualitative data on caregivers is really what's happening with the caregiver. And again, What's happening with the caregiver is changing, as you can see, throughout the illness course. I don't want to walk you through all of this, but to just kind of show that really caregiving needs need to be sort of um, centered around what's actually happening in the illness. Uh, so our intervention was targeting specific caregiving skills to try to uh, affect caregiver outcomes, specifically quality of life, their burden of caregiving, mood, and sense of self-efficacy. And we're currently in the early processes of this intervention. So we, are, we finished phase one where we basically refined the intervention based on feedback from six caregivers who have gone through it. And we're currently go doing a pilot randomized control trial of 36 caregivers that have gone this, through this thus far. And I'd say the biggest uh, thing you know, that we've heard from our caregivers is they really have had tremendous positive feedback about the intervention. And they talk about the importance of mapping the intervention to the course of illness, how critical that is for them to help them through and guide them through this process. So to end, I'd like us to kind of talk about where do we go from here from a research perspective. One is we really do need to think a little bit about how caregivers' preparation for their role of caregiving in the context of a cancer diagnosis affect both patient and caregiver outcomes. We need to identify caregivers at highest risk for burnout and caregiving burden. And I'd argue that caregivers caring for patients with severe mental illness automatically will fit in that category. Um, assessing, uh, developing and testing interventions that are specific to a population that span the illness trajectory, that focus on that point in the illness trajectory, and assess the impact of these caregiver interventions on both caregiver outcomes as well as patient outcomes. Um, we also haven't really touched on the idea that caregiving perceptions change based on culture, ethnicity, and social norms, and that's a whole other area of research that's essentially lacking. And lastly, I'll put a plug for technology-based interventions because they are a good way for the future to really disseminate our interventions and to reach most caregivers. With that, I'll end. Thank you very much. Thank you.